It's really cold and my camera's gone all misty. I'm gonna have to wait for the camera to warm up. What is up everyone? This shop Matt here. So I have tried to do this video probably 10 times. I don't know, so many times. Every time I try and do it, the rope fish aren't out. What I'm hoping for today is that they might make an appearance, they might not, but I might film this whole video and then have to overlay shots and footage of them because every time I try and film, they're just nowhere to be seen. That's so annoying. So as you can probably guess, the return of fish vase is here. Obviously I've stopped traveling around. We've been to Maidenhead Aquatics Wimborne and done escape with MD fish tanks. I've been to NT Labs um, HQ over in Kent and I escaped a tank for them. I've done a few other things that I can't say about yet, but there's some cool stuff in the sort of pipeline coming up. But now that I've stopped traveling and I'm back in my own store fairly, yeah, for the foreseeable future, I thought I'd get back into fish files, which is, yeah, one of my favorite things to do, to be honest. As you have probably guessed, today's fish file is on Ropey McRoperson, the underwater danger noodle himself, the rope fish, the reed fish, the snake fish, whatever you want to call it. Now this fish isn't going to be able to live in everyone's aquariums. They are a specialist fish. That being said, they're probably one of the more community-based oddballs. There's certainly, I suppose it would be restrictions. There's certainly a lot less restrictions to these than there are to you know, a good majority of predatory oddballs. These fish are native to West Africa. They're coming from places like uh, Angola, uh, where else, Congo, Cameroon, uh, I think Nigeria as well, among others. I'll put a little map on the screen so you can see roughly where I'm talking about. Rope fish come from really slow moving to almost still water. Now, because of this, and as their name suggests, these places are full of aquatic vegetation, so lots of reeds, surprisingly, that those rope fish are going to sort of snake in and out of and use their, I suppose, their shape and their swimming style as a bit of an advantage. Temperature-wise, they seem fairly adaptable, inhabiting anything from about 22 degrees to about 28 degrees. It's really early in the morning, so Fahrenheit will be on the screen because I haven't got the brain capacity to be doing that this morning. They seem to like a neutral to sort of harder pH when it comes to water quality. That being said, they do seem fairly adaptable and I have seen them being kept in softer waters. Us here, actually, we keep them in about 6.8. Our tap water is really good in the southwest of England and comes out at about, yeah, 6.6 to 6.8. And they seem to get on really well in there. As I've already touched upon, they come from really slow moving water. Now this means the, there is a low oxygen level in most of the water they come from. But in the aquarium, give them well filtered, clean water, and they do really, really well. Now, maximum sizing seems to be anywhere from 20 to 50 centimeters. Again, inches will be on the screen somewhere because don't have the brain capacity to think of the conversion for that. But yeah, 20 to 50 centimeters seems to be an average size for them. It's quite a big gap, but they're a bit of a funny one. I've also read a report I was sort of browsing through the other night trying to find some information out about sizing. I've also read a report that says that there's an undocumented case that one got to 90 centimetres, say three foot. So that's like, well, this tank is eight foot. So just under half of this tank. No one knows where that came from. No one knows. No, no one knows. They'd, someone's just said at some point, mine got to 90 centimetres. Probably just a fisherman's tail, but who knows? Rope fish tend to be a bit more of a nocturnal species, so you generally do not see them during the day. That being said, our three that are in here normally are fairly active during the day. You see them out and about swimming around, especially when feeding, obviously. But if you're trying to get them to be a little bit braver in the aquarium, maybe some dimmer lighting, make sure there's loads of hiding spaces, loads of places for them to get in under, you should see them a little bit more often. One fish that you will see fairly commonly in the aquatic industry, in the aquatic trade, is the polypterus or uh, bircher, bichir, biker. Um, I'll put the spelling on the screen. I've heard it's pronounced so many different ways now. I'm not even sure which one is right anymore. Um, but yeah, they are not to be confused with that. The problem with polypterus is that they do get, not bigger actually, they get around the same sort of size, but they have a lot more of a predatory instinct to them. Um, I've seen them take out way bigger fish. They have a larger head 
and they can be a lot more aggressive when it comes to the predatory sort of side of things. They are both closely related to each other. They are, um, yeah, distant cousins, I suppose you would say that they are. It's a tricky one. It's just doing your research, making sure that uh, you've got the right one. Essentially, rope fish don't really have a pattern on them. They'll have that clean, olivey green sort of colour to them. Olivey green? Yeah, we'll go with olivey green. With then the scale definition that you can see. Most polypterus have a bit of patterning to them. So you'll be able to see the scales and then you'll be able to see almost like a, a camouflage pattern or a mottled or marbled sort of pattern on them. There are a few that are plain, especially the Senegal bircher. Um, bircher, bircher, bichir, yeah. The Senegal one, they can be a very plain colour and look a bit like a rope fish. I suppose the thing, bircher's, bichir's, <laughs> will be shorter and stubbier. Rope fish should, in theory, be longer and more sort of slender. But get on Google, make sure you know what species you're buying and you should be good. There are a few things to consider when or before buying a rope fish. The main one is how escape proof is your aquarium. If there are any small gaps in the corners, if there's any, uh, yeah, any gaps, they're gonna find them. They will be on your floor and they will be wandering across your floor. And obviously they will not survive long when they are drying out. So the main thing is to make sure your aquarium is super, super secure. You can do this by blocking up any corners, any um, access panels where the filter pipes and cables come in, blocking it up with lumps of foam, um, anything, anything that can come to hand. Some people will glue mesh onto it. You've just got to make sure they are super, super secure because if there is a way out of your aquarium, they will find it. As much as they need a tight fitting lid, you've also got to make sure that at the top of the surface, there is an air gap. Now this is because rope fish actually can breathe atmospheric air. They can come to the surface, they can take in gulps of air. Now if you've got a tight fitting lid, there is nowhere for them to do this. They actually have like a, how would you say it? An adapted swim bladder that means they can breathe this air. So yeah, as much as you need a tight fitting lid, make sure there's a little gap that they can get up to and they can breathe and use that air at the surface. Setup wise, it's fairly easy. A nice soft substrate at the bottom, something like a fine sand works perfectly. They're gonna spend a lot of their time on the bottom, sort of snaking their way around the bottom of the aquarium. So you don't want anything sharp that's gonna cause irritation to them. The other thing is places to hide. So rocks, bogwood, planting, anywhere that they can get in and under and explore is the best way to have your aquarium set up for them. It's probably the coolest thing, seeing them pop out between two rocks. I'll try and get a shot of it, but you'll see this little head poke out between two rocks, seeing what's going on, and they'll snake off. So the more hiding places you can give them, the more confident they're gonna feel. As much as ripfish are slightly predatory, they're not that bad. I wouldn't be keeping them things like rummy noses or neon tetras, something really, really small, but any of your medium community fish are absolutely perfect. So. Obviously things like Congo tetras are a perfect thing to put in with them. If you look at some of the South American tetras, Bleeding Hearts, Colombians, Buenos Aires, any of those bigger tetras are absolutely fine. While on the sort of point of shoaling fish, rainbow fish, hundreds of species of those that are a good size, deeper body, the uh, rope fish aren't gonna bother them. And then along with barbs, as long as you're going for your more peaceful barbs that aren't gonna be really big and fast and aggressive, should be absolutely fine. Things like tiger barbs, black ruby barbs, Odessa barbs, they're all gonna be fine in the aquarium because they're just big enough not to be mouse sized and also peaceful enough not to bother the rope fish too much. Now, I wouldn't put anything too territorial and aggressive with a rope fish. This could spook them, cause them to jump, cause them to hit the surface hit the cover that you're using on top of the aquarium. Yeah, I wouldn't put anything too territorial. That being said, there are some bigger fish that you could mix in with them. Garamis would be a, a decent example. You know, they would be big enough and not aggressive enough to live quite happily with the rope fish. The other thing is some of your South American cichlids. So things like, um, what am I thinking? Severums would be a good choice. Uh, some of the earth eating species, Geophagus would be a good choice. Um, to be fair, we've got Crebensis, which are a um, African river species of cichlid. We've got the jewels. They can be a little bit more territorial. In a big tank, they're okay, but in a smaller tank, I wouldn't recommend it. 
But yeah, I would say anything that's sort of bigger and more peaceful should be fine with them. For the bottom of the aquarium, same rule stand. As long as it's not too aggressive, too territorial, you should get on really, really well. Probably things, you know, most of your peaceful catfish, even some of your bigger Corydoras are gonna be fine in there. Probably a risk to put things like red-tailed black sharks. If you've got enough territory, they'll probably be okay, but it's just making sure that everyone's got a home to go into. Most of your sucker mouth catfish species as well are gonna be big enough and ugly enough that they're gonna look after themselves and not be bothered by the rope fish. One thing that I didn't actually remember to put in this, and everyone asks me in the comments, is tank size. Now the problem is with tank size is everyone has a personal opinion on it. There's loads of different calculators out there online that you can use, and it is a tricky thing. Obviously rope fish, the bigger aquarium you can get them in, the better, you know, they're gonna be a big fish. They're not gonna be small. So personally for me, juveniles, I wouldn't go anything less than about 250 liters. Once they start growing up, you're gonna be stepping into the realms of 400, 500 liters, and it's gonna be a five or six foot aquarium really, because those fish are gonna get big and they're gonna want that space. For feeding, they are micro predator. No, well, not micro really, are they? Medium predator? Um, anyway. Any frozen foods are going to do really, really well for them. So things like bloodworms, brine shrimps, mysis shrimp, krill. Yeah, pretty much any of the frozen foods should be readily accepted. Just make sure before you get them that they are feeding well in the store. Most stores that are decent won't mind you asking what they're feeding on, you know, how often they're feeding them. Sometimes even asking them to see, asking the shop to see them feeding. Most good shops will be happy to help you out with that. The other thing that you can look at feeding them is pellet food. Now it's gonna to have to be sinking because they are mostly gonna be feeding on the bottom, but things like decent catfish pellets, that would be a good starting point for them, especially if they're a little bit smaller and your rope fish are a little bit sort of more juvenile. Then you could move up to things like the sinking predator sticks or the sinking, even actually our stingray pellets that we use probably would be okay for them. But a good varied diet is always key. I think I say that in every video. A good varied diet is always key. I would get bored of lasagna every day. You need variety and so do your fish. So finally we come to breeding. Now rope fish are very, very tricky to breed. There's a few documented cases sort of, yeah, about online, but not many. Most of the time, the ones that seem to be about is the fish are very old. Oh, well, I say very old, maybe not old for a rope fish, but 10, 15 years plus. And then the fish have shown signs of breeding. Now, generally that is the male and female coming together, swimming through the plant sort of almost um, parallel, yeah, parallel to each other. And then if they are ready, the male and female will come together and they will spawn. Once that happens, the male, from memory, male cups the eggs in his fin, like that, <laughs> something like that. He'll cut the eggs and then they'll go and distribute them. They'll just scatter them around the aquarium. Now they are sticky, so most of the time they'll stick to plants and rocks and wood and things like that. Um, and from there, the egg will stay until it hatches. So after sort of three or four days, this probably varies depending on the temperature you're running them at, but roughly about three or four days, the eggs will start to hatch. Then they'll have their little yolk sac that you see. So that's the little, um, the yellow bit that's on the belly of the fry. They'll use that up as their food source over the next few weeks. Once the fish hatch, you'll be faced with what looks like, um, well, I suppose like an axolotl really. Um, they, they, blah, 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 blah. When they're young, or when they're freshly hatched actually, they have external gills. So they'll have those frilly gills. These will slowly sort of disappear as their fish matures and grows into actually being a real fish and not a weird axolotl fish. Once this happens, you have got the tough game of feeding these fish. Now, I would suggest anything small. So I would try, you know, freshly hatched brine shrimp, maybe some small uh, micro worm cultures. I don't know, you know, you're just gonna have to try a few different live foods to start them off. They might go straight onto frozen, but with most of these fish, you do have to start them off on a live culture just to get that feeding instinct going. So if you want a breeding project that's gonna be probably 10, 15 years in the making that you're gonna to have to possibly mature these fish, maybe not 10, 15 years, cause you'll grow them at, you grow them? You'll buy them at a few years old. So, but if you want something that's gonna take you a long time to work out how to do it, this might be the project for you. 
I might be still doing a YouTube channel. Come and comment on this video in 10 years time if you've uh, successfully started breeding rope fish. It'll be uh, good to hear from you. There we go, rope fish. I haven't seen them in my camera once since doing this video. So I think this is gonna be many, many types of getting footage of them throughout the day and overlaying it at the end. But yeah, I have literally not seen a single rope fish in the screen while I've been filming this. So we'll see how much footage I actually am able to get of them. But until next time, lots more coming up as always. Just need more time to do it. So uh, I'll see you in the next one.